Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel, Censored Authors Speak, here with every library and We Need Diverse Books. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. We are so happy to have all of these fantastic authors here and very grateful to all of our attendees for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Naval Caroni, for introductions and um, have a great time at this panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for that. I could not be more excited to see your beautiful faces in these boxes on a Wednesday evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would love for you all to introduce yourselves. Just give us your name in a one line and um, and then we'll take it from there. Adib, do you want to begin? Oh, wow, this is an attack. Me first. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm Adib Karam. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the author of Darius the Great is Not Okay, Darius the Great Deserves Better, and uh, Kiss and Tell, uh, all queer books about brown kids. Um, so yeah, that's been super fun right now. Thank you. Skylar, you wanna go? Sure, my name is Skylar Baylor. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I am the author of OB is Man Enough, which is about a Korean American transgender swimmer who's um, 13 and not me, <laughs> because I'm also a Korean American transgender swimmer. Um, and uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Ferguson. Um, I am Métis on my father's side and white on my mother's side. I am the author of The Summer of Bitter and Sweet, which came out May 10th or 11th from Heart Drum. Hi everyone, I'm Malik Pancholi. Um, I'm the author of The Best at It and the upcoming book, Nikhil Out Loud. Uh, both of them feature gay Indian American kids because I'm a gay Indian American adult and I wanted to write books that I didn't have when I was a kid and I'm gonna continue hopefully to write books about gay Indian American kids until I feel like there are enough in the market because I still feel like there are not. Um, so I'm on a mission. <laughs> Thank you so much. So. This is a really funky time uh, in the world and in right now, right? Um, and as an educator and someone who is like often in charge of choosing books for classroom libraries, um, you know, I I live, eat, and breathe this. I I'm an, on a mission to make sure that our kids have mirrors, right, and windows. Um, Dr. Eugene Bishop Sims to make sure that they see themselves in these texts. I think this is so critical. But right now, especially as we're approaching this like holiday for our country. I think it's really interesting, right? Like, what does it mean to celebrate our country? What does it mean at this specific time when things are so maybe not right for a lot of people? What does that mean and how can you continue to create? I'm like so curious to know how has our mission changed and shaped um, specifically when we're like at the juxtaposition of celebrating something that maybe we don't feel that we are celebrated. Skylar, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, um, well, I can speak to, uh, you know, a lot of different pieces of this, I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, this this year and last year were record breaking numbers of anti trans anti LGBTQ plus legislation, as I think most of us probably know, um, <clears throat> we've had a massive attack on trans athletes, specifically and trans young people playing sports. Um, as we all know, there's been a massive rise in anti-Asian violence. We've seen uh, a massive attack on bodily autonomy um, just recently, right? So, um, <clears throat> I think all of these things are culminating at a time when we are then expected, right, July 4th to celebrate freedom and um, and freedom for who, right? And that's the question I always ask myself is whose freedom are we celebrating? And the answer to that question is 1776 was the freedom of cis white straight men <laughs> um, and pretty much nobody else. So I think that when I think about that and think about what I want to celebrate and what I want to grieve, because I think these two things kind of go together, grief and celebration, grief of what you know brought us to where we are, celebration of where we are potentially and where we want to be. Um, I think a lot about, how do I explain this best? I think a lot about trying to A, hold both and B, celebrate all the things that I think um, black and brown, BIPOC, LGBTQ plus people, trans people, uh, especially black and brown trans femmes have brought us and celebrate that because I think that's so much more important than celebrate this sort of nebulous concept of the country. Um, because to me, that is celebrating. If I celebrate the country specifically looking at where it comes from, I'm looking at actually a lot of white supremacy, a lot of uh, uh, misogyny, a lot of transphobia, and so on. I don't know if that made any sense. Hopefully it did. 
No, it totally does. I'm curious to know, you know, like how can we how can we continue creating in the face of like our own personal stories being censored? You know, I, I think that you spoke a little bit to that. Malik, do you want to add? I mean, I thought that made so much sense that I feel slightly like, how can I ever add to, to the brilliance of that? But I, I will say too that the idea, I think, of um, having to fight for something that you believe in, um, to me, like July 4th, I think is a lot about that, even though it's the culmination of the fight that came before it. And, um, you know, I, I feel like, in a way, that's something that I've sort of had to do my whole life. <laughs> um, sometimes that fight felt really subtle, but it was just like, you know, how am I going to protect myself in, in environments where I feel unsafe? And um, perhaps I developed some unhealthy things around that. Um, now as an adult, I feel like that fight is about like shedding those unhealthy things and saying like, I can take up space, you know, which, which is something I think that a lot of um, LGBTQ people, certainly people of color feel like how much space am I allowed to take up in the world? I know as a kid, like it was very easy for me to shrink in the corner. And now um, as an activist who's, who's uh, I have a nonprofit that is 100% dealing with the rise in anti-Asian violence. So much of that mission is like, tell your story, tell your story, tell your story, be loud, be proud. Um, and certainly as someone who's LGBTQ, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, to answer your direct question of how do we continue to make work in a time when our work is being censored, uh, I feel like it's imperative that we continue to make that work. Um, I grew up in Florida. I, I, my middle school years and my high school years were, were in Florida. So the idea that my book is now being banned in parts of Florida at a time, uh, you know, I look back at that time and I'm like, what would it have been like to have seen uh, myself in the books around me? What would it have been like to have seen myself on television? What would it have been like to have had a sing single openly gay person in my school even? <laughs> and so I feel like the need to continue to make that work is stronger than ever, not to be trite and use the stronger than, you know, now more than ever phrase, but I actually feel pretty fired up. Um, and I, I know I'm talking so long, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I, I, have, um, I have a second book coming out in October, and a question has been like on the table has been, where do you want to go on book tour? And Florida feels important to me. I'm like, let's go. Let's find those schools that'll invite me and like make a lot of noise. Um, and hopefully, uh, that's a way to let kids know this book exists. And if your school won't give you access to it, that there's a place you can go to find those stories. Oh my gosh, I. Um so in love with everything that is coming out of your mouths. Jen, we were just talking about how we can continue to create in the face of censorship, especially in light of kind of the intersection of celebrating our country when our country is not celebrating all of the beautiful spectrums that we are. You want to add? So, so maybe the first thing I need to tell you is that I'm not American. <laughs> um, uh, but also I'm, I'm native, so that problematizes celebrating the birth of a nation that, that came in and, and took over land that was not theirs to be taken. Um, but how do you keep creating? I mean, like, I, th I think what you have to do, and here's the dog, there you go. What you, yeah, Nixon, everyone loves Nixon. Um, what you have to do is, is fuel yourself somehow. Um, and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And I always, I always say this to, to writers when they want advice is that they have to take care of themselves first um, in order to be able to continue writing because as BIPOC or queer or disabled or otherly marginalized writers, you need to, to have extra fight in you, right? You have to have a little more um, in order to be able to do your job. Adeev. Mm. Uh, I mean, everyone's saying such smart things. Um, I was a senior in high school uh, when the September 11th attacks happened. And so basically my entire adult life, um, this country has been killing people that look like me. Uh, so I don't know that I've ever, I don't remember the last time I celebrated Independence Day yeah. um, or felt particularly celebratory about uh, where I live. And I feel like my entire adult life has been a slow descent into cynicism um, about what the United States claims to be versus what it actually is. Um, this will surprise no one. 
um, who has read any of my work, but I watch a lot of Star Trek. Um, and I think often about Star Trek's message that the future is not a utopia that it will come to be, but is um, something that we all must work for and build. And so on my really dark days, when I'm like, well, all my books are gonna get banned. Also, the ocean is going to swallow the country um, and the planet is on fire. I remind myself that there are still young people who deserve the best future that I can build for them. And so I will use whatever tools at my dis are at my disposal to build that future to the best of my ability. Yeah. And then I will uh, go and watch some Star Trek to recharge. And so when we're talking about kind of, you know, for educators and librarians who are making decisions for their classrooms um, in places where, you know, potentially our stories and our realities are banned, like our truths are banned, what suggestions do we have for them? Like what noise can they make? Are we going round table? Skylar, do you want to start this one? Um, you know, I think I, the first thing that I thought of is, is to listen to the kids. I think that oftentimes we prioritize the voices and the opinions and the power of adults and we don't listen to kids. And I think kids know a whole lot more about themselves than we give them credit for. Um, <clears throat> specifically with regards to transness, kids are able to know their gender identity as young as three years old and every major medical, psychological and psychiatric association agrees with that. <clears throat> it's just the people um, who are in lawmaking positions of power who have decided to not listen to the experts. Uh, so I think that, um, I think we can trust kids and I think we should. Uh, and sometimes trusting kids means trusting that they're able to digest a story that they might not have read before. It's trusting them to learn outside of the box that they have been raised in. It's trusting them to be able to love more than hate. And I think that um, we don't often give them that space. Instead, we fear the chaos that might ensue if we present them with something that might make them uncomfortable. And the reality is that uncomfortable or discomfort is the only place that we will really, really learn and especially learn to grow together. And so I think we really, really have to trust kids. I desperately want you all to come and talk to my four children too, because I do a lot of fumbling when I'm trying to talk to my own kids about things that I think I, you know, am ready to talk about. And I, that's exactly right. My kids know more than me. My kids are so much more open than me. I, 100%. Like, I feel like you had something to add. Well, I just wanted to kind of address the thing about like what we can do to help educators and, um, this, I'm sure this story is not going to be something that I'm sure we've all experienced this on some level, but on, on my first book tour, uh, I remember going to a school where the kids to um, Skylar, Skylar, is that, am I saying your name right? Yes. Okay. Um, Skylar, um, talking about the kids knowing better, you know, it's like I 700 kids in an auditorium um, clapping at a picture of me and my husband, whooping when I, you know, tell them when I tell them that the lead character in my book is gay. And then a few days later, um, parents like protested the fact that an openly gay author had been there. And, you know, in, in the way that classically this stuff happens, like all these falsehoods came out about the things I had said and how I was trying to interact with the kids and really kind of kind of gross stuff. And, um, you know, I don't want to get anyone in, in trouble here, but I, I talked to uh, someone who works at the school later and I think they were horrified and embarrassed and felt badly and they didn't want me to have known about this. And, and I realized that like, in a way, we have to give them space to have an emotional life um, and to say, like, this is challenging <laughs> um, and that, that, that there are people who want to get books into the hands of kids who, who they know need them because they interact with these kids on a, on a daily basis. Um, and I think as authors, like, we have to, to, to find a way to, like, create a support system for, for those educators, too. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would just say one other thing, too, is that I, I, um, I was talking to someone uh, uh, who, who's involved at Teach for America. And we were talking about like, is there a way to create like a shadow network to say like, okay, if you can't have these books in your school, can you become a resource for kids? Can you, is there a way to let kids know that like, if you need to see yourself in a book, there's a place you can go. Um, so how do you, how do you subvert the system if the system is, um, is holding you down? I love that so much. There's lots of there's lots of talk about teaching specifically the banned books, right? Like who's going to teach the banned books? Is that going to be your book list? And then having conversations with kids about why do you think they're banned? It takes, you know, I mean, this is talking about teachers who feel like they're not going to have a job potentially. So I believe in the like subversive shadow networks also in spaces where like literally they might not have a job the next day. 
you know, it's easier to say it in like a place like Chicago where I live right now or, you know, New York City where I'm moving, et cetera, et cetera. So totally. Jen, did you want to add on? So I, I, I've been thinking about this and I have a lot of respect for, for librarians and educators. Um, and I know so many of them are, are like fighting the good fight and, and doing the work and that they often know better than I do about like how to do their own job. Um, but then I'm, I'm thinking of people in the profession who haven't done the work themselves yet. And they think that, that doing like putting a, a book with a character of color on the cover on, on the shelf is the work when that's like not the work, the work you have to do um, is in your own life and, and on yourself before you can actually be effective doing the other work. So I was was talking to some writer friends of mine who are, 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 are white queers and there was an article that came out talking about white queers um, writing a POC love interest. And both of my friends who were lovely humans like texted me and were like, can we talk about this? And and the conclusion I, I came to was you have to do the work yourself first. And then like the writing is second. So like the librarianship or the teaching is second. The work has to come first before you can do any of that well. So um, if, if you are an educator or a librarian out there and this is like hitting home and you're getting the tingly feeling in your body, I'm like, do the work for yourself first, and then you can do the work for the kids. Well, this is definitely a, like a three-part situation because it's it's um, being the teacher who has a text that can, to, who can offer a text to a kid who knows that they'll see or find a mirror, right? That's like an independent reading text. There's the teacher who wants to like totally change the canon and not teach the canon that we're used to learning and that is like arcane and old. And then there's the teacher who says, I'm not ready to completely revamp my curriculum, but I'm going to layer all kinds of texts in, in to make sure that there's like a variety and a wide breadth because no group is a monolith and it's not the old canon anymore. Right? There's like all these different layers to it. And I, and I wonder where to start because I'm like a leader of professional development for teachers. I also don't know where to start, but I think we all know that a Band-Aid approach and one swap won't work. Here's the Black story. Here's the Iranian story. Here's the Middle Eastern story. Like that will not do. We know this. Um, at least, at the very least, yes, you need to do the work. Do you, we've been on panels about this before. We have. Well, and I'm thinking a lot about what Jen is talking about, about the work. Um, I don't know who all pays attention to social media, which is, as we all know, the worst. Um, but certainly we saw an example of people failing to do the work quite frequently over the weekend when a bunch of white librarians decided it was now time to attack Jason Reynolds for choosing to not speak up and interrupt an elderly white Jewish woman in a room full of white people and risk being perceived as the angry six foot four black man. Um, I think now really is the time when white people either need to show up or shut up and admit that they're willing to be complicit in what's going on in this country. That means um, doing things outside of the classroom. It means going to school board meetings. It means going to library board meetings. It means talking to local news organizations. It, mean, it means investigating the existing networks that already exist that have been in place for, in some cases, decades, um, generally created uh, by Black women and by other BIPOC folks. Um, it's really time for them to, to show up and have the uncomfortable conversations. People are always asking BIPOC and queer creators, what should we be doing? What uh, can we do? How do we get our books onto shelves? We're gonna keep writing our books up until they you know, murder us all, basically. Sorry to get dark. Um, it's up to the people that are most proximate to power to look power in the eye and say, hey, you're wrong. Uh, have the uncomfortable conversations with their communities and with their peers uh, to change things. Um, I've been seeing, a, I don't know if anyone else is on TikTok, also a terrible social media that I can't stop scrolling. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of videos where uh, it's white people talking about how to talk to other white people and the sort of uh, radical empathy you need to do to sort of sort of slowly deprogram 
someone who's a bigot uh, and find those places where you can agree and then find those places where you can sort of show them how their point of view with a tiny tweak really can lean toward equity. Um, those conversations are exhausting, uh, especially for queer people, especially for people of color. It's exhausting to have try to have that conversation with someone whose fundamental belief is that we shouldn't exist. Um, but white people can have those conversations with each other uh, in ways that say I can't have with a white person or I can't have uh, with a homophobe. So, um, sorry, I'm just going on a rant now, but yeah, Jen already said it, do the work and the work isn't, the work doesn't end on your shelves and it doesn't end at your classroom door. Um, gosh, I'm feeling really like fired up, I guess, but like this is literally a fight for the future of the children in this country. So you like, you gotta fight. That's what it comes down to. So that makes me wanna cry because then I also think about just like our own livelihoods and our own, do, do you think at all about the creations that you make and like whether or not it'll sell? Like whether or not in huge swaths of like the, like it won't be allowed or won't be bought or won't be purchased? Do you think about I that? Mean, I mean, constantly I have rent to pay and it's probably going to go up because the economy is uh, trash as well. Um, sorry, I just went right in again. I'm sorry. I'm, it's too late now, sunken cost. Um, every, every book I've written probably for the past 12 months or so, there has come a point in the writing process or in the editing process uh, where I'm like, oh, well, if it wasn't already going to be challenged just for being brown and queer, this passage or this scene uh, is going to get it challenged or is going to get it banned. Um, because people don't like when you write the truth. And the truth is that being a child, being a teenager is messy and imperfect and you make mistakes. And adults don't like it when kids make mistakes. Um, especially adults in power. And so, yeah, every single choice I make, I'm like, will this affect my livelihood? Um, maybe this will all come, you know, crashing down around me and I'll have to go uh, find another day job. But I think the cost of listening to that voice of fear is uh, much, much higher. And I think all of us are in this because we care about young people and they don't have even the fraction of the power that we have as adults. And if we let fear stop us from using what little power we have, then I think we're letting children down and we're letting ourselves down as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Does anybody have anything specific they wanna add? Malik. You know, so like, I feel very privileged to have not kind of worried about this until very recently and then, um, I'm embarrassed to say this, <laughs> but I'm going to say it. I, I stumbled upon a review, an early review of um, my next book. And literally this person said, uh, I love this book, but I probably wouldn't be able to have it on the shelf in the part of the country where I live. So I guess I'm gonna have to figure out another way to get it into a kid's hand. And it made me think for the first time, like, oh, there's people who will not buy this book because it's about an openly gay uh, 13 year old. Um, but then I also think that like, like I just like on a personal level, uh, first of all, like I spent so much of my life trying to be more white, trying to be more straight um, as a human being. But as an actor, I was like, oh, if I can just be whiter and straighter, I'll make more money. I'll be able to like have jobs. And I'm in a place where I like that, that is not an option anymore <laughs> um, uh, for so many reasons. Um, but also the, the, like the, the, the greatest, the, the parts that I've gotten to play where I've had so much joy have been where I can be able to bring so much of my experience as opposed to hiding. And so to me, the idea of um, writing a book for saleability, sure. But writing a book for saleability because I'm covering, I'm going to hide something or cover up something feels like, it just feels so, uh, Sorry, I feel a little emotional about this. It feels so demeaning. It feels so demeaning in a way that I don't. I don't think I could do. And the other thing that I want to say too is that that I do feel like 
for all of its problems, the world of TV especially is pushing, I think, some boundaries. And I know that a lot of uh, us have, have been able to sell our stories into that world as well. And that feels exciting to me because what are they going to do next? Are they going to say you can't access HBO Max in Florida? Is that going to happen? Maybe. But it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. So, so at least like there are ways we can keep fighting to have these stories accessible, um, accessible to 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 young people. Um, yeah. I thought that was beautifully said. I feel I feel very emotional about all of this too because I think about. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I, I called myself Iranian American, but I recently realized that makes no sense because Iranian is modifying American and that is not, that like puts the, um, it kind of puts the strength on Americanness. And I'm not, I'm Iranian and I am American. I'm both those things and they can both exist. And so it has taken me a really long time to kind of, and I'm 40 this summer. And I just don't want that for any of our kids, right? And I think that this is what we're fighting for, this like um, just railing against hyphenated identities, no part of ourselves checked at the door um, in schools, whether that's language, whether that's any part of us, right? Any part of the spectrum of us. Can someone speak to that <laughs> kind of, you know, this idea that being our whole full selves is what we're trying to represent in our creations, whether or not we're going to be censored, whether or not we're going to be banned. Tyler? Yeah, I mean, I, I think especially when you said the word hyphenated, so I'm somebody who's half Korean and half white, and I have spent my life in, in a hyphenated state. Um, and what, you know, I think, there, I remember recently somebody asked, was the first time you were aware of race? And I, I, I really cannot remember a time when I wasn't aware of race because it was so apparent in my household. My mom is Korean and looks like an East Asian Korean woman. And my dad is a six foot three white men, like they look very different. Um, and so that's always been apparent. And I've always been asked, are you more Korean? Are you more white? Actually, it was usually asked, are you more Korean? Are you more American? And I've always been not white enough to be white with the white people. I've always been not Korean enough to be Asian with the Koreans or the Asian folks. And I've always been tugged. And I think that that actually in my childhood for a while was hard. But once I learned how to recognize that that just meant that I was my version of myself, I was my version of Korean, I was my version of American and my version of an athlete, my version of, at the time I was using the word girl because that's what I thought I was supposed to be. I was my version of whatever girl meant. I was my version when I finally figured out that I'm actually trans, I'm my version of what a man means to me, right? And I think that, um, the power I want to give young people, kind of going back to an earlier thing I said, is, is the trust in themselves. Give them the space to define who they are and recognize that we all actually exist in these approximations of, or we use labels as approximations of who we are and in, a, in an attempt to use words and all of us as authors to connect with other people, right? We use those, but they're all approximations. They're all fake at the end of the day. And it's actually who we are that's real. And I think that's, I don't know if this is answering your question of all, but it's something that I think about constantly, which is how can I be the most of myself so that I can encourage somebody else to be the most of themselves. And when I share my truth as a Korean American queer transgender athlete, which is pretty much attacked from every single different angle you can possibly think about, when I share my truth and my humanity with somebody else, I want them to see my humanity, but that's not my end goal. My end goal is that through me providing my own humanity, I hope to welcome them into their own. And as we do that, then we can connect, then we can actually welcome all of ourselves because I, then, I think when we hate, when we discriminate, when we exclude, we actually limit ourselves in addition to limiting others. I'm just like letting it sink in. Jen, you're doing lots of head nodding. Do you wanna add on? You all are so brilliant and, and you're you're saying all these things and I just want to be like sitting here giving you the snaps. The dog is giving you the snaps. Um so I guess I guess maybe I'll add on two things. And and one is that if I'm anything, I'm I'm a really messy hybrid um and a and a late bloomer and and all these these understandings of identity have come to me late or have come to me hybridized in some way. And I'm really conscious of that when I write. And I'm really conscious of that as a, as a teacher. Um, and I'm not thinking so much about selling books. Like 
I sort of think that's Harper Collins's problem and yeah. not my problem. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking back to what Adib said earlier and thinking about like writing that scene and is this the scene that's that's gonna get me censored? Um, and I'm I'm working with Heart Drum, which is uh, a native children's imprint. Mm -hmm. And and my editor is like a really powerful white woman who uses her power really well. So I have never felt like I couldn't write the truthiest truth thing and, and have it like get published. I'm not, I'm not sure like when I do that, how much, um, how much power I have once it's published, how much power I have to influence someone picking up the book or someone seeing my book and like not labeling it as a queer book because it doesn't say that it's queer on the like front cover or have like a rainbow somewhere on it. Right. So like, I don't know how much power I have once I've written my truth and it's been published. Um, that's, I think that's, that's really up to, to publishers and librarians and teachers and parents and the people who can buy books and can show that we want more of them. So I find this to be fascinating because I'm writing a book on family literacy for educators with Heinemann. And I have found the same, that in some spaces, my voice and my suggestions for how we can elevate cultural capital from homes exists and stays. And then I've written for other publications and it, it's completely what they call out every line that I think has voice and that I think has heart. And, right? and so I think that really makes a difference, making sure that the people who have at the publishing phase are our words can keep it intact. But then it brings me to a question about classrooms and the people who then have our book. How do you think that then we can protect? I mean, I guess once art goes into the world, it goes into the world. But how can we protect protect it and protect our ideas once they're out there, once they're gone, once they've been released? Do you know what I mean? And I think probably, Skylar, the answer is listening to the kids and letting the kids use the text and have conversations as opposed to letting adults lead it, because adults tend to butcher it. But what do you think? I mean, once it's gone, it's gone. I mean. Malik, if it then turns into TV and then it goes right, there are places where we still can have control. But then once it's gone, is censorship not an issue anymore? What if people excerpt and take parts of it? You know, I really have that question about our art and our creations. Adim. Well, I'm thinking uh, a lot about uh, Kyle Lukoff, who, uh, an illustration from his book. Oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing. I literally was thinking about it today and now I'm blanking the name. Uh, something Something Max, um, one of his picture books. Anyway, it was literally like blown up and behind Ron DeSantis as he was signing the don't say gay bill in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like there isn't. Thank you. Someone in the chat said, call me Max. Oh, yes, Max. that's the one. I knew there was a Max in it somewhere. I'm just clearly either I've had too much tea or not enough tea still the jury's out. Um, but at the end of the day, we cannot, you know, books belong to their readers and whether those readers uh, are young, um, intelligent, empathetic kids, as so many are, uh, or whether they're bigoted, uh, monstrous adults, we cannot control what's out there. Um, all we can do is make sure that the book is as full of, as full of integrity uh, as we can make it ourselves, um, that we are saying what we want to say with as much clarity as we can. And um, it's frustrating at times, but we eventually do have to let go of it. Um, because I think otherwise we'll really um, kind of destroy ourselves and destroy um, our artistic spirits if we linger too much on uh, what is ultimately, you know, in print and done. Um, at the same time, yeah, it is terrifying um, to wonder if someone's going to misread a book, um, see something, you know, monstrous in it. Um, you know, many queer men are often, um, well, there's just a lot of uh, really nasty stereotypes about um, being predatory um, that, you know, I often worry about um, in my own work when I think of, you know, trying to accurately represent what it felt like to be a queer teenager, um, but being a queer adult myself, you know, I wonder what people are going to read into it. 
Um, but I cannot control what other people think and do. I can only control what I think and do. And so I try to remind myself of that and not let myself spiral into too much existential dread. Molly. I just wanna I just wanna hop onto something and I'm I'm not sure if, if this is what you meant by this or not, this or not, Adib, but I feel like um I feel like in the world of straight literature or straight everything, because that's basically what we've had for decades <laughs> or centuries. Um, you know, I'm writing middle middle grade books, you know, and it's like it's uh like 12 or 13 year olds were allowed to have sexual feelings for other characters for for you know take the wonder years for example you know 12 year old kevin arnold kisses winnie cooper in episode one and in episode two he steals a book called everything you've always wanted to know about sex but we're too afraid to ask and that was applauded that at 12 years old he wanted to get with a girl um that that sort of thing the care that has to go into that around uh, a gay character because of, and I don't don't know if this is what you meant, Adib, but the idea that the gay people are seen as predators or that that, that our sexuality is somehow um, scary or going to you know hurt someone else or um, that's that's actually like a um, I feel like we have to like do something about that, <laughs> whether it's like writing these things and normalizing these behaviors and letting kids know that it is okay, you know, to have a crush on another kid and it's not weird or gross or in the same way that a straight character could. I don't even know where I'm, I'm going with this now. I feel like I'm just like stumbling through words. Um, but <laughs> but I, I just wanted to, 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 to bring that up and to say that uh, that we do, I mean, I had a conversation about this uh, about this today, you know, like like we're working on an ad an, an adaptation of um, of my novel uh, for television, and we're writing a scene in a locker room because the character in the book tries out for the football team, and having to be careful about uh, the fact that that space is is there's a charge to it, but without. Will the other side, you know, will this conservative side be like, well, that's why gay kids can't be on the football team? Because, like, the fact that we have to think about that, where I don't even know where I'm. Well, I'm I know exactly where you're going <laughs> yeah. because I can give you a real life example of exactly why this is so important. Because my 11 year old, and I'm a mother of four young kids, an 11 year old, a nine year old, a six year old, and a three year old. And my 11 year old went to a sleepover and played spin the bottle and kissed a girl and was in all girls group. And the mothers were. I didn't know there were gay kids here. How could I live in Chicago? Like, this is not, I mean, I didn't think either my friend, like I, I was so flabbergasted that the mothers were flabbergasted that there could be potentially girls kissing girls here, that this is the kind of stuff that needs to just be so ridiculously normalized that this is not any different than, you know, they thought it was a safe space of all girls. Do you know what I mean? It, and this is, I was shocked shocked so imagine how important it needs to be even just for all the mothers to understand <laughs> like all the mothers all the fathers all the caregivers so let me not say mothers alone right but this was a conversation among me and some other mothers and i just so important it was not any different than i mean what to say see now i'm fumbling but it's a real life example <laughs> it's a real life example of my representation everywhere it needs to be so accurate and whole and normalized and I mean normal is a constant well I, I just wanted to add on I mean I think a lot of it for for what, what I'm hearing and what I wanted to add is people are afraid of of ex, of letting kids explore and people are afraid of letting kids explore specifically what they think might be wrong or harmful or fear they, they, they're afraid of might be different might might lead them to a result that might not align with whatever the parents want them to be which which brings me to a, one of the things i think about a lot and talk about a lot with kids that i, that I mentor um, is that parents often want the kids to be who they want to be right parents often want their child to be fulfilling all the dreams the parents never fulfilled and then the, the kid doesn't get to be themselves they get to be a version an attempt of a version of what the parents never got to be and i think that we see this often i think we see this with with straight kids i think we see it with cisgender kids i think we see it with gay people i think we see all kinds of people uh, because parents project onto their kids what they want them to be and i think when the kid fits some version of what the parent wants them to be then there's a little bit of like calmness for the parent and i think 
that's one of the reasons I think, not the reason, but it's a reason that I think people are so fearful of books that show difference, right? That show something that could be an exploration for those children, especially for the children that are already exploring it um, or are already exploring who they are. And I, I, I don't really know, I'm, I'm now, we're all, we're doing a fumble train, but I'm fumbling for what the, the point is that I'm trying to make. But I think, I think it's that um, for parents who are listening for any, educators and adults who are listening today, I think it's really important to let ourselves explore and then by deep, by like extension, let our kids explore. Because I think there's this huge fear of a kid. And I think, I don't remember who said it earlier, but not only of making mistakes, I think people don't like it when kids make mistakes, but it's even further than that. People don't like it when kids are confused. Adults and, and parents and teachers don't like it when their kids feel confused or don't know you know, what they feel. And I think that's the most beautiful space. And we have the power as adults to positively uh, appraise those moments. If a kid falls down and doesn't get hurt, but you say, oh my God, are you okay? The kid will immediately start crying because you are appraising that moment as negative. If you say, the kid says, well, I don't know, I'm confused. You say, awesome. That's a great place to be. Let's talk about it. Let's explore that confusion. The kid will learn that that's okay. And we need so much more of that for all kids, not just queer and trans kids, but for anybody. Adults need it more too, actually, but <laughs> that's a, Desperately, that. desperately in process. I'm in process. It's a great place to be. Jen, did you want to add on? So like the ultimate fumble is I have no idea what started all of this. Um, I have no idea how we started this, but the thing that I, that I will add on and I will say is as a teacher, my teaching philosophy is that learning is uncomfortable and that it shouldn't be comfortable, that you have to be safe before you can be uncomfortable. But there is something about recognizing what it feels like in your body when you're uncomfortable and that when you are in that state, you are therefore confused and your confusion means you are looking for learning like you were you were searching some kind of wisdom and that search is super important like that is is where we can internalize something or recognize something in ourselves that hasn't been handed down to us from our parents and like my parents are lovely humans and did a pretty good job with me but you know, they still handed down some stuff that I've had to sort through. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's how I'm gonna end that one. So when you write your books, I'm pretty sure that all of you are not saying, this is the end all be all truth, but you're actually saying, come and explore this with me. Come and, come and explore these ideas with me. What do you think about your your art and your creation and your process as being a place for kids to fumble and a place for kids to just start the conversation? Like if we think about it that way, I think our books are way less scary and censor worthy, to be censor worthy, ban worthy, right? Like, right? If it's a place that it's like, this is my truth, sure, but also explore this with me. What do you think about that? I do. Yeah. Um, I th it's really weird to, talk, to think about a book as starting a conversation because I feel like fundamentally um, I can't converse with the reader or at least I can't hear, I can't hear their response to me. So it's a little more like a soliloquy. Um, this is me sharing my thoughts and they just have to sit them and respond to them or discuss with other people. Um, some, uh, there's a quote that I was kind of introduced to very early in my writing career um, from the Nobel laureate Kazuo Ishiguro who said, um, stories are about one person saying to another, this is the way it feels to me. Can you understand what, is I, what I'm saying? Does it feel this way to you? And um, that's always really stuck with me that I'm not so much, um, I'm not so much engaging in a conversation as I am laying my cards on the table and offering a reader the chance to pick those cards up um, or shuffle them and draw new ones. Um, but that's, for the most part, never going to happen in front of me. And um, it's delightful when it can. I love getting to talk to young people. Uh, I really miss doing school visits. The pandemic has 
um, really diminished my joy in getting to see and talk with young people. Um, but yeah, it's really weird. So yeah, I mean, I definitely see it as engaging, but I feel like conversation is not how I would quantify my, my approach. That's so fascinating to me. That's so interesting. Really. I, I just want to, I just want to, the idea of um, making, I, I think, I think the way you phrase it was like, if it's a conversation, it's less ban worthy. Mm. Um, I sort of feel like that's kind of buying into the narrative of who gets to decide if, uh, you know, that whether this book is ban worthy or not. And I, and I sort of feel like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I sort of feel, well, yeah, I sort of feel like, it is both of those things in a way. Like, I feel like I hope a kid reads the book and is like, oh my gosh, I see myself for the first time and I didn't have words for that. And I want to explore that. And I also hope a kid reads a book and says, that is my truth. And either one of those things can be can be equivalent and one doesn't make it less ban worthy or more ban worthy. And also the word worthy around ban is making me feel a little weird too. Yes, no, no. <laughs> but I but, and I just wanted to say one one thing about the last um, the last question, and I think it started with um, you know the the what happens when when your when your writing goes out into the world and um, someone else might interpret it differently than than you intended that kind of thing. I I actually did get to do an in person school visit recently, and it was like one of my first ones, and it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and there's a character in in my book who who I have always thought was straight, and. Uh, um, and this this uh, this girl at the school gave me a drawing of like an, a more adult version of the, the lead character and this kid and they were holding hands and there were hearts and she was like I think they're gonna get together someday and I was like amazing so just like the positive thing too that can happen when someone takes your thing and they extrapolate a story into 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 what it's gonna mean for them I think that's um, you know there's something that uh, there's something good that can come out of that too. I love that. Thank you so much. And I'm glad that you called me out on that worthy. No, no, no. I didn't. I just, as a, the more as I was saying it, I was like, God, now I feel weird saying it. I mean, that was not meant to, I thought, I think it's a no, totally valid question. Don't. I, I, um, I'm glad because of course nothing is worthy of being, I just think that if we, um, if we never say this is truth and that's the end, nobody can ever question us because this is a place of we are exploring alongside everybody else is what I meant. Right. I think like we're all, you know, Jasmine Wargo was the person, Adib, the author who who said, every one of my books is like a, a conversation with my audience. I don't get to have it, but I am saying, have these conversations with each other. So I think it was so interesting. I, I love all of your feedback and um, everything that you're saying. From the audience, I like love this question. With all of the censorship happening, is there anything that's giving you hope? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Come on. Um, I have, well, can I can I add one thing to the previous question and then answer? Is that okay? Um, yeah. Try to be. I'll try to be succinct, which I'm not great at, but I'll try. Um, when I think about banning books and banning, well, when I think about banning books, I think about banning stories, and then I think about banning people. And I think that when we talk about banning books, what I think sometimes at least even I miss as I think about the concept, okay, they don't want that story told, they don't want that, you know, those that language, that whatever, that's against their beliefs, that's against their religion, blah, 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 whatever. Sorry, the dog is having a, a day down there if you hear the squeaking. Um, so it, when I think about this, like, then I realize we're, we're really not talking about banning a, a book, we're not talking about banning words, we're talking about banning who we are. And I think that what, at least I miss that sometimes, and I wanted to just say that as explicitly as possible, when people ban books, we are banning a humanity, somebody's truth. We are saying that doesn't belong here. And when you say that, we're saying who doesn't belong here? This person doesn't belong here. Their truth doesn't belong here. And I think that we all really need to think about that, not here necessarily, but like society needs to think about the concept of banning books. And Malik, this is your, your comments from what really made me think about this is like, when we think about banning and the con the, the worthiness of, of, of something to be banned, um, we're really thinking about what stories is society okay with not hearing? Whose humanity is society okay with deleting? And the answer is very clear, right? BIPOC, queer, trans, marginalized, disabled, and so on people. Um, and I just, I don't want that to be any less explicit. <laughs> I think we need to see that in its in its clarity. 
Um, but to answer the question of all about um, hope, so I, I, I spend a lot of time with trans young people and um, and sometimes these kids uh, have, like, so the, this most recent experience I had was with like 10 young ki trans kids, they're eight to 10 years old. Um, many of them had transitioned around ages four or five because they had supportive parents and supportive resources. And they were all brought together to be able to like play sports together for a weekend, um, which is charged as is, if you think about the, the, you know, landscape for trans kids and sports right now, but they all came together and they just played. For a weekend, they played together and there was these, you know, this laughter, you know, the screams of kids playing down the street at the playground and you just can hear them having fun. That was what I heard for a weekend. Um, and they, the thing that was the most powerful about this weekend was that the kids didn't understand how powerful it was. They didn't understand the meaning of having this sacred space, but the three trans adults that were there sort of in this space, helping curate the space, we were like in tears the whole time. Um, and I, I think about that because that's what gives me hope because despite the fact that there are hundreds of anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ plus bills that are going around the country right now, banning pretty much anything that a kid wants to do, go to school, go to the bathroom, go to the doctor, play sports, be safe at school, um, be at home with their families, you know, all these things, these kids are somehow still finding joy. And not only are they finding joy, they're finding somehow the resiliency to be themselves, despite everything in the world saying that their stories and their truths don't belong. And if that isn't inspiring hope, I don't know what is. That was beautifully said. And so we just have a teeny bit more. Does anybody want to take that question? Another beautiful one is what dream do you have for your book? I, just, I want to just hop in with a comment on something that I said earlier that actually like was a big wake up call for me, if that's OK. And that is um, that it's so important that we're having this conversation and that we are uh, addressing this at this state now, because I heard myself say, what are they going to do? ban HBO Max, but we are already seeing a governor who's taking on Disney in his own state. So yes, that is, that's where we go if we don't have these conversations and, and talk about it and, and start fighting back. And I want to say like around the hope question, um, I, I mean, I feel like I just want to double down on, on, on what Skylar already already said, but it is kids that give me so much hope. It is kid, it is seeing videos of kids in Florida chanting, say gay, say gay. It is, it is kids that I saw in New York uh, having protests at their school around gun violence. The fact that they're educated and dealing with these issues at, at, at this age, which is maybe sad as well, but that they're, give, they're, they're having a voice. I mean, I don't think I was doing that at 12 or 13. Um, so there's something about that, that I, when I see these kids activated, and I think that that's, you know, I think that there's some hope in that. There's some hope in that. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, everyone, but hopes and dreams are, are, are really hard for me um, right now. Really, really hard. And I, I don't know if that's because I teach like 18 to 22 year olds and, and this past year, like normally they're the people who I'm like, oh, the kids are okay. And if the kids are okay at this Jesuit university I teach at and, um, you know, and they're, they're queer and, and they're, they're BIPOC and they're disabled and they're like, they understand where they're going. Um, that, that used to be what fueled me, but this past year was really, really hard. Um, and, and, you know, the kids I was teaching were, were losing hopes and dreams. Um, so I, I want to have hope, but I don't see good models of like the U.S. and and the like grand populace of the U.S. rising up and saying that we we won't take this anymore. Uh, I see us being angry on the internet for a couple of days and then letting it become whatever it is, whatever hateful thing it is, letting it become normalized and. And letting that be just like the new normal. Um, so I'm I'm really struggling. I I don't want to I don't want to like leave us here. I want Adib to like I'm passing the torch, friend. Oh, you gave it. You passed sorry. in the wrong direction. Oh yeah, um, mirrored screen. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, earlier this month, I went to New York and I happened to see um, Sanaz Tusi. She's an Iranian American playwright. I saw her. Uh, play Wish You Were Here, which tracked five Iranian women 
from 1978 to 1991 as they watched their country disappear around them more in ways that they could not have expected that they kept insisting it wasn't going to. And I saw the way that their dreams were stripped away, um, transmogrified uh, and erased. And I think of the Iranians in my family um, who came to Canada as refugees who came to the United States for school and then never went back after the revolution. Um, and it's hard not to see some really morbid parallels with what's going on. And so hope is something I'm still searching for right now. And as much as young people amaze me, it's not, it shouldn't be their job to give hope for adults. It is our job to be making the future better for them and giving them hope. And I feel like we are failing at that. And so that makes me really sad. And um, apparently I'm the, apparently I'm Mr. Downer today. So go me, I guess. I think you're all amazing. I think you're all brilliant. You are 100% correct that nobody's humanity can ever be questioned and that we can we started this conversation talking about being fueled and activated and never stopping the fight. So, and Jen, you said self-care. You said take care of ourselves, right? Was there anything else in our five minutes left, final thoughts or one thing that you want viewers to take away from this incredible conversation? It can't, it can't stop here. Like when you log off this, platform and you close down your computer like I would like everyone listening to think of one active thing that you can do when you when you close out this window um whether that is something that you are doing for the work in yourself or whether that is something you have to do to take care of yourself to keep fighting or whether that is a, a thing you can do in your community or or at your school but well, we need to do something after we we talk That was beautifully said. Skylar, Malik. Malik, you want to go first? Go for it. Uh, I, you know, this is, I would say um, the first thing that pops in my head is vote. <laughs> um, I would say and vote, vote locally, vote, uh, vote on the smallest level and vote nationally and get people to vote and, and because I feel like there's this great disconnect in a way between what is what what we actually want, uh, what what a majority of people want in this country, and what it, what um, and who is getting to pass the laws, um, and uh, um, it's so important to get the right people into the ridiculous power structure that that we have somehow let run away from us. Um, so, vote. Oh, I, I second everything everybody said. Um, I'm trying to, I don't want to repeat anything. I, I think one of the, one of the most important things that I think about when we come in these spaces and have these really important um, moving conversations, I've teared up multiple times. I know that I, I've heard other people say this, that they felt the same sort of emotion. I think these are really powerful spaces, but I, I found often that the space is powerful and, and it disappears as soon as we, we do. And, um, for people who are listening, um, maybe feeling fired up, maybe feeling a little bit uncomfortable because you learned something, maybe feeling a little bit dysregulated, maybe feeling excited. Um, I think building off of what Jen said in terms of making an action, understand that the people that we need to reach are not listening. They are not here. They would never once click on this link. They do not know what WNDB is. They don't know how to, they don't know what BIPOC or BIPOC means. Um, they don't know what trans means. The people that need to hear this conversation would never be caught dead on this link or in any of our spaces, and it is your job to reach them. Because these levels of allyship cascade outwards. And if you're here, you care. And I'm so grateful, I think all of us, I can speak for all of us, we're all so grateful that you're here listening. And your job now is to go pass this on to somebody else, to go share this voice, to go amplify what we're saying so that more people can learn. Because again, the people who really need to shift will never be here, but they will be with that person that you talk to, who they talk to, and, and so on, right? So the true allyship begins, the true active allyship begins when you take this conversation outside and keep talking to the people who would never be here. 
Authors, you are so amazing. I hope that you stay in touch and that I get to see you in real life. And I'm going to invite every library um, for final words. We need diverse books. And every library, thank you for hosting us. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to, to, to listen to this conversation. I was on a call. I'm, by the way, folks, I'm John Kraska, Executive Director for Every Library, the Every Library Institute. Um, I was on a call today um, with the library in rural America where the library was reviewing their policies uh, the other day at a board meeting. And before the board meeting, there was a, a prayer vigil held by a local church. In fact, two of the churches in the local community were on the Southern Poverty Law Center's hate watch list. Uh, they did a prayer vigil uh, in front of the, the library. And then at the library board meeting, uh, it was one of those parades of proud boys coming through. And folks, every library and our friends that we need diverse books are on the ground every day in authentic ways, listening to what's happening in those communities, um, showing up not just for the First Amendment, but the 14th Amendment, the issues around equal rights and, and protection of the individuals. One of you said, and then all of you uh, agreed, that the when they silence a book, you're silencing a story, but they're using these attacks on books as attacks on individuals and populations. Um, everylibrary.org, folks, for uh, ways you can get involved in, in supporting our work and getting involved on the ground as well. And then diversebooks.org from our colleagues that we need diverse books as well. Thank you, everyone, tonight for uh, spending a little time with us. To the authors, uh, to, to our moderator, um, I'm really excited to, to be in a position to invite you to uh, share this also on our Facebook if you're watching it there. It's super easy. And our YouTube if you're watching it there. It's super easy. Let's share it. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.